listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Estella. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 237. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com. Hitaboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The Hitaboard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hitaboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hitaboard.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by 1TDC.com. Dog agility can be hard on your dog's body. Help keep their joints and muscles healthy with 1TDC. One tetradecanol complex is a clinically studied blend of unique fatty acid oils that can support your dog's joint health. 1TDC promotes a healthy inflammatory response from head to tail. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. Today, we are very excited to be joined on the podcast by AKC representative Kitty Bradley. Welcome, Kitty. Hi, you guys. We asked Kitty to join us today because AKC has a set of new rules and regulations that are going to, that went into effect January 1st this year. (laughs) And uh, there's some really exciting stuff in there. And we wanted to talk to Kitty about the ins and outs of these rule changes. Um, There are several that apply to course design, but the two that everybody's talking about right now are for exhibition only and fix and go, which have been added to AKC Agility. Uh, So we wanted to talk about all of these changes and what they mean for you, the competitor. So we'll actually uh, start with some of the um, changes to course design that have come out. We're going we're gonna to wrap up the podcast with fix and go and for exhibition only. Um, but there are some other changes that have been made that change how courses are designed. And one of those is allowing a third tunnel. So for those of you who may not um, be as well versed on the exact requirements of the courses that you're running, previously you could only have two tunnels on a course. Um, back a few years ago, you could have two tunnels on a course and a chute. And so, uh, with the rule changes going to effect, we are adding in uh, a option of a third tunnel, but it has to be really short. 10 to 13 feet, and it can only have, you know, the slightest curve. Um, so Kitty, tell us a little bit about um, the, the thinking behind adding this back in and what that does to our course design. Okay, well, one of the reasons we added, um, there were a couple reasons we added um, the shorter tunnel into it. Um, one of them was to essentially take the place of what in the past was the shoot, as you had uh, discussed. But one of the other reasons was to allow a little bit more flexibility in design, especially in some of these spaces that were a little smaller or had obstructions like poles or were long and narrow. And what it was, what it w- would do is it would allow a little bit more um, uh, creative room for uh, those types of spaces. Um, And then another reason is we're also seeing that tunnels have got kind of a a big popularity um, around the world. Um, And it was to open up the idea that you could um, essentially have more design um, freedom um, with the use of different tunnels. So can you have two short tunnels or three short tunnels or it's only max one short tunnel and you have to have two big tunnels? Maximum uh, one short tunnel. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting because um, we work with some judges from around the world to design practice courses uh, for us and for our students. And um, one of the first times that we asked for a practice course, they sent us one that had four tunnels and we had to tell them, look, there's there's nobody that has four tunnels for setting up a course in their backyard. Uh, and we had to back off on on the number of tunnels. So you're right. They definitely use tunnels um, to for more creativity and course design abroad. Yep. Um, the other interesting uh, changed recommendation is in jump spacing. And um, tell us about uh, the the rules versus the regulations when it comes to spacing. All right. So we have guidelines. That's the judges' guidelines. That's their kind of book on uh, how we recommend they conduct themselves or do design or 
you know, judging, et cetera. The regulations are different than the guidelines. That comes through approval of AKC's board of directors. That's a little bit more of a process to um, basically update the regulations and get certain things passed. So when you saw that we added the 10-foot tunnel, that, for instance, had to go through the regulations because that's kind of how that's housed. Um, when it comes to things like uh, more distance to a uh, option, we used to have a distance to an option or an off-course obstacle would be 20, uh, 21 feet. We now will allow up to 23 feet if it's like a direct option. It's pretty much right in front of the dog. So we opened up that space. That would be in the guidelines. That would not be in the regulations. And so that's where we could sit there and we can make changes um, a little bit more fluidly um, with that type of um, change. And I think that's really interesting because um, this spacing requirements, the, the set in stone spacing requirements, the minimums have not changed. However, the uh, recommendations to the judges and, um, and also how they're going to have approval for their courses and what kind of feedback that they're going to get from their reps, that is what's kind of changing, where we're uh, encouraging the judges to open up these courses and, and provide a little bit more space, you know, for example, for our larger dogs or our extremely fast dogs that um, the, the, those minimum spaces are just a little too cramped for those kinds of dogs. Yeah. Now, remember, the 18-foot criteria is still fine for certain things. Um, the minimum that still exists there. You know, for instance, going from, you know, a tunnel onto a teeter, mm -hmm. um, those types of things. I think that when a dog is having to launch over a jump, that's where those kinds of spaces make more of a difference. Awesome. And then the um, other thing, so mm -hmm. it's a balancing act because we have probably of all the organizations, we've got more, I call them sub 18 inch dogs than most organizations. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have to balance those dogs' ability to navigate the course as well. Right. Um, so it's not always about the biggest, it's about the balance. Right. Wonderful. Um, for those uh, people who may not be familiar, um, the next uh, thing that I wanted to talk about was weave poles. Um, I saw that tape is no longer allowed on weave poles. So uh, a lot of clubs for, I mean, for decades, people have been just getting white PVC and then using electric tape to uh, mark their weaves so that there's some visual element for the dog. So tell us a little bit about that change there. We changed that because we know that over time tape degrades quite a bit. And a lot of this equipment is sitting around in trailers that could be getting hot or cold all the time, and people aren't really able to inspect the equipment all the time. So the reasoning we had, we got rid of the tape is for the safety of the dogs. We could see that dogs were scraping their faces, possibly scraping their eyes and things like that. And so that's where we essentially wanted a seamless surface that could not degrade. And that's where we changed the rules where they either had to be painted or kind of an extruded color into the weed poles. Yeah, that's a wonderful change. I think for people that have um, never had a dog get hurt or never seen a dog get hurt, it 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 doesn't make sense, right? Like, what's so bad about tape? But um, over years and years of doing agility, we've definitely seen uh, this be a safety issue for dogs. And it's not something that you can really control or somehow teach the dog to to do things differently to keep them safe. Right. So I think that's a great. Um, change there. And another change to the weave poles, and this one I think is a little amusing because I have not, I have not seen uh, judges utilize this in, in a very, very long time. But technically, before January 1st, judges could use anywhere between 9 and 12 weave poles. So how many of you out there have uh, run into, in competition, 9 weave poles? Because let me tell you, it's very, very different. The dogs, in, they exit differently than they do on an even number of poles. Um, I haven't, I think I saw it one time at a trial and it was probably 12 years ago was the last time I saw it. I didn't even know it was still a rule, but uh, you guys have fixed that and now it's either six or 12. <laughs> That's correct. And there are probably only a couple sets in the country. Most people have gone to 12 poles and that rule, by the way, is, is July 1st. 
Oh, okay. So right. they have from now until July, any of the clubs that have to have those, which are very, very few in the country, that they have time to be able to purchase new weed poles. Wonderful. So no more having to uh, stress out about nine poles. Most of our listeners probably didn't even realize that they, uh, that, that was something that they needed to be prepared for. Um, and then uh, the other change that I noticed was any dog being able to enter ISC. So this is the International Sweepstakes class. Um, and there's only a few of those in the country, but previously you had to be master's level and now any dog can come and enter those classes. Yeah, and we had done that change to Premier probably a little bit over a year ago. And in part, what we were doing was we were opening up kind of some of our criteria so that maybe a dog from another venue that already had the skills and the talent to be able to handle some of the more challenging courses would be able to come into an AKC trial and feel like they had the challenges that they wanted for their dog. Perfect. All right, let's move on to the two uh, changes that are getting all of the buzz um, and that is for exhibition only and fix and go. So we're going to start with for exhibition only. Um, so for exhibition only means that you are um, stating as you go to the line that you uh, do not want this to be a real run. You're in a real venue. You've got real pressure. You've got uh, the real environment. Um, but it's not going to be a real run and you can go out and you can uh, bring a toy into the ring uh, and you can essentially do any kind of um, practice in the ring during your standard course time that you want in terms of you could repeat obstacles as many times as you want. You could, is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that is correct. Um, the whole idea behind that too is to make it a positive experience for your dog um, and the judge would still be judging if they think you're being good to your dog. So you still have a little involvement in there um, from the judge, a lot of involvement actually. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much your time to go out and to try and work on some things that you and your dog need to work on in the higher stress environment of agility trial. This is such an amazing opportunity for people that are first going into the, the ring uh, with their dogs. Well, let me jump in here and I'm going to play the role of competitor who has not heard about any of these things. And so I've got a lot of questions. Now, this FEO sounds great and I want to do it. So do I need to uh, pick out a run on the, uh, the entry sheet? Like, do I need to know like weeks in advance? I want to designate one of those runs as FEO? Uh, no, you can actually do it the day of the trial. And we haven't mentioned yet, but for exhibition only is only valid in time to beat and fast and at the discretion of the club. So this is not always available. You have to check the premium to see if the trial that you're entering is allowing FEO entries for their time to beat and fast classes. Okay, so it's only time to beat or fast and... I need to do it on the day of the trial. Is that first thing in the morning, like when I get there or when I show when up at the there, line? You can do it when you set up for the line. The only requirement we have is when you enter and you check out whatever that height that you're jumping at is, that you must remain in that height. You cannot change the height that day. Right. So, mm. so I've gone and I've entered my dog in the you know 20 inch division. And I don't know if I want to do fix and go when I enter, but that day I decided, darn, I think I need to do it. My dog is looking like he needs some help, um, I need to stay in that 20-inch division. Mm -hmm. And part of that, you guys, is so that we can make sure that that trial can continue to flow and we're not changing jump heights and gotcha. those in the exhibitor board all the time. Okay, gotcha. And there you said fix and go, but you meant FEO. FEO, yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. And so then this thing about jump heights is interesting. And this was something that Sarah brought to my attention. So let's say I have a 20 inch dog, dog jumps 20 inches all the time, all competitions. You know, I never jump the dog higher. I, I don't do other things. You're saying that I could FEO in time to beat her fast at a different jump height than 20 inches and then yes. run all my other runs that weekend at 20 inches if I so desire. Yep. And could I do that at eight inches? Could I do it at yep. four inches preferred? Yep. Whatever I want it. Whatever you want. Because remember, as soon as you rent to the wrong height, you essentially are you've given up your run anyway, even current, you know, in the past, because mm -hmm. you have to jump in your designated height. So if you decided to jump your 20 inch dog in eight inches, you can do that. You just, and is it. this something I need to go to the scoring table at, at the very beginning of the height class, like during the walkthrough, or is this something like I can literally have my dog in my hand, be the 
the fifth dog in and say, FEO, I want this to be FEO. And then I just tell the, I, I guess, who is it? Well, you the, entered in a height to begin with. You, that day, you, when you entered on your form, you entered a height. You haven't decided FEO or not. Mm-hmm. If you knew ahead of time, you would enter in the other height. But gotcha. yeah, that's one where you, en- you have to run in what you entered. So basically, if you think you want to run in a different height than what you are, uh, than that you're eligible for, then you you have already made the determination that you're doing FEO. Right. Um, right. So okay. So that you can decide ahead of time and enter a different height, and then if you've entered your correct height, you can decide the moment you walk to the line. Right. Interesting. I think that's pretty interesting. I think that has a lot of application maybe for dogs who are a little overwhelmed in environments because one of the things that you can do in any setting, right? If you know, I teach my dog something uh, in the backyard, they can jump 20 inches there, but I take them to the uh, weekly training class and uh, you know, they're not as comfortable, but when I drop the height down to 12, then they're able to do all the things that they can do in my backyard. Right. Kind of do that over there. It, it makes me think of, uh, actually, I, I hadn't thought about this until just now, but my first run in agility, uh, my Rottweiler refused every single jump at 24 <laughs> inches. Every single jump. And, and this was, I mean, decades ago, I was, I 20 was young. Ago. 20 years ago, I was, you know, a baby in agility and I was a baby in real life. And it's I, amazing you didn't quit. Now I, that I think about I it, know. right? And I literally ran up to the first jump and my dog ran up to it, ran around and I said, okay, let's go, let's go. And I ran to the second jump and she stopped and I ran around and then I went and did the teeter and then she did the teeter and then I ran up to the next gump, jump and she refused it and I ran around and I literally did the entire class, <laughs> right? And I was, you know, I, I... And this is a dog that went on to be great. Great, like, right. Fantastic. And so yeah. I, I'd kind of forgotten that until you say that just now. Like, you know, if, if that happened to me today... Uh, I probably wouldn't finish the entire course, but I, the very next uh, trial that you I go to, I could enter height. at yeah. eight inches, 12 inches, 16 inches and go out there and get build some, some success, build yeah. some confidence. Yeah. So, and you yeah. know, maybe your whole goal on that one is I'm just practicing contacts and I don't really care about the jumps. Right. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah, you know, so it's just like, you know, fall. my dog is in all these other ones. I'll just make it easy on and make it lower because really that's all I'm trying to do. Interesting. I think that's an interesting one for bar knockers who are working on contacts. I've had a couple dogs like that because uh, the last thing you want to do is uh, uh, like if your dog is a bar knocking issue, a lot of people are, are they, they don't want to reward the dog if a bar comes down. But what if the bar comes down on the jump right after they've done a beautiful contact and you're really there to work the contacts, right? And now you can't, you feel like you can't reward the contact. But if you drop it all down to eight inches, 12 inches, the bars are generally not going to be an issue you can focus on the contact training that you're doing. So very yeah. interesting uh, opportunities here for training, uh, for really communicating to the dog a little bit better. Hey, you know, it's okay for you to do these things in this environment. And, l- and let's talk a little bit about um, what's allowed in terms. Of, so basically anything goes in terms of what you work on. You can go out there and just do the A-frame for your allotted time or just the dog walk for your allotted time. But the other thing that you can do is take Wait, a- so you're saying I can go out there and do like nine dog walks. Yes. And just use my whole whatever course time is. Yes. Right. Yep. Uh, I don't think it's actually course time. I think it's a set it's time a set as time. soon as your FEO. Yeah. Um, mm. But yes, your allotted time, you could use it all on dog walks. But the other great thing is you can take a toy into the ring. And um, But there are some restrictions. So let's talk about those. So the toy can never leave the handler's hand. That's so in, in my mind, this basically means you know, you, you want a tug toy, right? Because you can yeah. hold on to it better than, let's say, a ball or something like that. Uh, unless you're going to, you know. But you can't it, throw it. But you can't throw it. So, okay. you know, those of us who have tug toys, we often throw the toy at the end. We can't do that. The toy oh. has to stay in the handler's possession at all times. And they can't have food in them. <laughs> they can't, right. They no. cannot have food in yeah. them. Yeah, so no food um, or treats in the ring. Only yeah. a toy and it That's can't right. leave uh, the handler. So those are the things to remember. And the toys, uh, I think I read this, cannot make noise, right? No squeeze. That's right. That's right. But I guess then you could take one of those toys where you have like a big fuzzy thing and a six foot line where you the dog can kind of chase that toy, you know, and yeah. grab it. We yeah. don't, Yeah. Okay. And no clickers. I'm assuming no clickers. No, yeah, no noise. Whistles, clickers. Yeah. yeah. So all Whatever. of us, we need to condition that verbal yes that is the replacement click so we can yeah. use that appropriately. 
So, um, so I think that that covers a lot of FEO. We may come back to some certain aspects of it when we talk about uh, fix and go, because I think that people think of these things as being um, very similar. And, and there are some similarities, but there are some very big differences. I think they work together really, really well. So we've talked about for, exhibi- for exhibition only. It's basically gets you ring time uh, and you can take your toy into the ring. Fantastic. Now let's talk about fix and go because fix and go is very interesting. It allows you to fix something on a course. And here's the really crazy thing I think that, that's awesome for competitors is that um, you can be running all out, running for a first pace place run, your dog blows a contact and you can immediately fix it. That You don't have to declare this anywhere. You just do it. It's the judge essentially that decides that you have fixed something. That's correct. And, okay. and marks so, it so as So you're such. saying, okay, so I'm the competitor again. Um, FEO, I have to tell someone before I walk into the ring. So everybody knows this is an FEO run. Right. Yep. But fix and go, I walk into the ring and I'm having a regular old run. My dog flies off the A-frame. And then I say, okay, we're going to do the A-frame again. And then as soon as the judge sees me do the A-frame again, now I, I'm not having a regular run anymore. Now it's fix and go. Correct. But it is not. So to be clear, I'm not suddenly in FEO mode. I can't no. suddenly fix the next five things. That's no, right. You, you can, you can one only do shot. One, one shot. That's right. You can fix one thing. So fix and go, you're talking about fixing one thing. And if, so let's say my dog messed up the A-frame. I redid it. They did it fine. And then they flew off the teeter and I tried to bring my dog back around the teeter. What would happen to me? You would be excused. Okay. So the judge is just going to ask me to leave. Yeah. yeah, they're going to whistle you off. Yeah, so true. it would be uh, it would be considered training in the ring. So I, I liked one thing that you put in the judge's blog that really kind of simplified it. And, and um, this is Kitty does a lot of the uh, judge's blog stuff. And she said, you can essentially think of fix and go as one free training in the ring. So the things that you used to get whistled off for, for training in the ring, you can now do, but only one time. But it's a little bit more powerful than that because you can, for instance reset a bar. So you can go and physically grab the bar, put it back and, and reattempt, um, uh, which is something that uh, would be extra, extra um, frowned upon <laughs> under the old rules. Um, so fix and go. You don't have to tell them ahead of time. You can just do it uh, in the middle. You don't really have to signal I don't to, even the need to tell the judge. No, you just, you just get your dog, you know, collect your dog uh, verbally or possibly even physically. So you can call your dog to you. um, And you can also go back a few obstacles so that you can get the same approach, for instance, to a jump. That's correct. Um, Awesome. Okay, now I have interesting detailed questions. A couple that are jumping into my head. So let's say I have a dog who has very creepy contacts. They're coming down the dog walk and they stop in the middle of the dog walk on the down plank. They're not yet in the yellow and I'm waiting for them and I'm waiting for them and they don't come down, can I go and pick them up and put them back on the dog walk, maybe at the beginning or even back in the middle? Can I do stuff like that under fix and go? Well, you're allowed to touch your dog. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I believe you're allowed to do that. Hopefully okay. many people aren't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay. And then... Well, I uh, think one of the, the big things that, that is highlighted here is that there should be no, nothing distressing to the dog right. and nothing really punitive to the dog. So you kind of have to balance everything you're doing against that intent. Right. Right. I, so that's good. I like that. Um, you know... But I, think, I about, think about the dog that, that gets stuck on the teeter. That we've seen that dog frozen and they haven't tipped it, that would be very appropriate for someone to just take their collar and help them along. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I guess at that point, if they wanted to hold the teeter a little bit steady and help their dog and then drop it, that would also be, yep. I mean, because that's a common training uh, method as well. Right. So you can kind of take that, take the dog back one step in the training, help them be successful, and then that's your fix and go. So for right. fix and go, we're saying that let's say I'm ahead of my dog and my dog I know is standing at the bottom of the teeter and they're not taking it. And I go to the other side of the teeter and I hold it upward and then I pat it, pat it with my head or my hand. <laughs> and then they're like, um, oh, okay, this is like practice. He's touching the teeter. He's going to hold it up for me. So I'll go up there and then I can gently lower it down. Can I touch Mm -hmm. the teeter in that way? 
Yep. Interesting. Okay. So now from here, let me go very quickly back to FEO. So in the FEO setting, can I do this exact same thing with the teeter? And can I do it over and over again until my time has expired? Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. The, that's interesting. the big difference, right? Is that FEO, you get, you know, as much as the time allows. Whereas until until you hit that fine line of that <laughs> dog getting stressed out by what you're doing. Right. right. And that's where we're putting a lot of, um, I guess, pressure on the judges. Like, uh, you know, thank you to the judges for, for doing this for us because for, for dogs that have, this is fantastic for all dogs, for dogs that are transitioning into the sport for the first time or their debut. I mean, this is amazing for them. But this is also super amazing for any dog that has a problem and that problem is only in the ring. It, yeah. it, is, it is just I mean, there are so many fewer tears that are going to happen over agility with the addition of these rules. Right. I, so here is where I would just have the, the, I don't even know that I would call it a concern or so much as like a prediction. But in the same way that everybody who goes to trial, we're all watching other dogs go, if we don't know that dog, we don't know them personally, we don't see how they train, we don't know what issues they have, dogs can look very different in the practice field than they do out in uh, a trial where it could be a uh, reasonable to do something, maybe guide them by the collar, right? If, um, you know, that's something that the dog has been exposed to, it's how they initially learned it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas two different people are going to look at it. One person say, okay, you know, that's no big deal. Another person might say, oh, I feel like the dog is showing clear, very clear signs of stress and feels that this is a punisher and different people are going to have in different interpretations of what's going on right in front of them. And so I think that could be a sticky point from going from judge to judge, because I think we all know judges who are very different in how they call things as small as incidental contact with a dog, right? Some judges are going to be like, you touch a dog and, and it, and it's going to help them go in the right direction. I'm going to call it. Other people are like, well, it wasn't intentional, even though, you know, maybe it could have helped the dog, you know, I'm not going to call it. Other people are like, you know, you you yell at your dog, I'm going to whistle you off and have a conversation with you. Other people are going to let a lot more go as far as people, you know, being harsh with their dogs in the moment. Um, so I, I view this as a part that's going to be open to interpretation, not just from the judge's perspective, but from the observing spectator's perspective, watching other dogs that they don't have background information on. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? You know, I think most of the judge. I, first of all, I see fewer and fewer harsh dog treatments today than I did ten years ago, five for years sure, ago. For sure, for sure. And I think that most people and the judges are out there for the good of the dog. So I think the intent with some of them, most of them, is going to be to basically pay attention and make sure that dog's okay. And you know, the other thing that's funny is it's usually the person in someone's own community that knows more about the harsh treatment of the dog than the judge, right? I mean, People know these people. Yeah. So hopefully oh. that will not be um, a problem. And hopefully people will understand that this is about the positive training of a dog. Well, and I think this is a good place to point out that both of these programs, the four exhibition only and the fix and go, these are one year pilot programs. And so we don't want to be out there. We, we, you know, we want to use it well and we don't want to be out there uh, pushing the judges or pushing the edge of what's acceptable or, um, or anything like that, because this is something that can benefit us so much. And um, we want to give them every reason to make this an ongoing thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, when I look at this from a training perspective, the two things that I'm looking at are uh, making things a little bit easier in, uh, in the trial environment, right. Lowering that kind of threshold for the dog. Um, but um, and, oh, and certainly for maintaining criteria. So this applied, you know, oh, contact yeah, lines, things like that. A absolutely. Um, so those are the two things, but overall, you know, as a, as a trainer instructor, I'm always going to, going to tell you most of your issues need to be hammered out in the training field, right? right? Your dog's weak somewhere, you know, that's where the vast majority of your work is going to come in. This is going to kind of help with that other 10% of problems where you kind of need that setting. You need that environment uh, where the dog is uh, having issues or you're not able to communicate to the dog 
um, exactly what you want. And so I'll note here that the the phrasing used, and where did I pull this from? Was this the guideline for the judges or from the actual rules that this came one? in there? Yeah, yeah where it one? talks about, okay, so the dog should not look, and, and now here's the quote, distressed and or resist. Right. And then the other one is they need to be, quote, gently guided and, quote, over obstacles. So the, the, that's kind of your guideline. So you can see that there's obviously going to be some subjectivity there. But I think as the handler, as the trainer, you need to really think about this and think about how this is going to uh, look to judges and um, your uh, fellow competitors. And uh, I think even more primary to that is, you know, the internal state of the dog. So you want to, you know, always keep that in mind uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, and once it, again, I think people have been doing that better. It's like the the one percenters. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Well, I will put an open call out and just uh, really request that people um, – give the judges the respect uh, that they're due. It, it, this is subjective, but there's really only one opinion that matters <laughs> during the run, right? And that is the opinion of the judge. They have been hired to to make that determination and to make that call. And so yeah. with the um, addition of all of this freedom that we have to do these things, uh, it comes with the understanding that the judge decides what's acceptable and, and that that is uh, their job to do. Right. Okay, so now I have a couple more questions. Let's say my dog has a table issue. Now, this is going to be in the context of fix and go. So my dog gets on the table, and then they break before the five-second count. Okay, I'll put them back up again. They break again. And I put them back up again. So now, do I get whistled off? Because that's now my second Well, issue. no, because that was kind of normal stuff, right? Well, it depends. Like, so if, because so the table is a unique obstacle. Well, where it, I could spend the whole rest of my time getting them up. Well, on there. it depends because until the five second count is over, you are supposed to put them back on to finish mm-hmm. the count. Right. But if the count finished, and then your I dog, put them back up your again. dog broke, and then you put it back on, that's a fix yeah. and go, right? But if yeah. the, the, if the judge was in the middle of their five second countdown, you're all you are already required to put them up back up. So let's right. say they say five and they get off, you put them back on. They say four, three, you get off, you put them back yeah. on. So that's that, not okay. So that I understand. So let's say my dog comes off early. I put them back on. They make the five second count. Mm-hmm. And then I release them. And then I say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do one more table, make sure he's got it really right. At that point, I would be fix excused, and go. right? Yeah. No, well, no, at that point, you would be fix and go. Because the first time you put them back on, the counting was still happening, right? Oh, okay. Yes. I see what you're saying. So, so you were just finishing so it the would obstacle. Be, it would have to be like the second time yeah. that I did that. Right. Got it. But let me tell you, I think that's an interesting question. And this is why. I'm going to let one of my dogs out here. Come here. Um, so some people got confused about fix and go on things that they could have normally fixed always like that. Okay. Right. right. That's why I'm um, happy. Yeah. And so, you know, so it's like, yeah, if your dog runs around that jump, you know, it doesn't take the jump. Yeah, you can go back and do the jump. You always could. Right. And so I think there's that fine line where some people on the things you could always do, that's still there without it being a fix and go. Right. So for, in that example, the dog goes around a jump. You could always call them back and have them do the jump, and that's not a fix and go. But what you couldn't do before was call them back and have them do the jump before the jump that they missed. Right. And now right. you can, but yeah. that would be your one fix and go. Yeah. Right. And, you know, think about three tries at the weaves. Right. So you, yes. can have, you could have burned your one fix and go, and then you get to the weaves and the dog didn't get in the weaves. You can still try it three times. Right. Gotcha. But now you can't try it a fourth because you've already right. used the fix and go. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So the weave pulls, that's a, that's a really good one. So you still have your three tries before yep. you have to go on. Yep. And so you can do a fourth try. That's one way to use it. Yep. And also, so let's say I try one time my dog refuses. And then my second attempt, I don't just try the weaves. I go and I add a jump or two before the weaves. First, can I add more than one jump or one obstacle before the weaves? Yes. Okay. And so if I do that now, do I get three more tries of that? No, you've done your one fix and go. That's right. Okay. Interesting. So that's an interesting choice that trainers have to make. And I'm going to have to sit around and think about this in my head a little bit and maybe even tailor this to individual dogs. 
do I want to give a dog three chances and then a fourth chance with just the weaves, no other obstacles? Yeah. Or do I want to go back and add the jump before? And I think it, a lot of that is going to depend on the dog and why we think they missed. And was it the difficulty of the entry that you want to get the same angle and speed back to the weaves? Or is this just a, uh, you know, like more of a not unrelated, right. like more environmental, like right. will the dog weave in this environment, then maybe I want a fourth chance. So, right. so then you have to, to be honest, you have to be a little mindful when you go in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you got to go, oh, okay. I mean, if you just directed the dog into the wrong side of the tunnel, well, go ahead and fix it. But you did that <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> on that one. But yeah, I mean, it's good to kind of think about ahead of time how you can utilize the tools that we're allowing you to use. Yeah. And that's what I've heard. Um, just, you know, we've had like six days of this so far. And uh, from people that have done this, the biggest thing they say is, um, I kept forgetting I had this option. Uh, so they, they immediately um, come off, even the ones who used it come off and say, you know, I did use it and it was great. Um, but there were some spots that I could have used it and and didn't, and I'm going to think about those in the future. So I think it's going to take some time for this to kind of become part of um, the very, very quick mental calculus that we do on course, uh, because it does happen so quickly. Okay, yeah. yes, totally agree with that. And I'm still working through examples here in my head. So again, as the handler, let's say my dog goes into the wrong end of the tunnel. And normally before all of this, I would then, my dog would come out, you know, and then I would put them into the other end of the tunnel and then I would go on. Now, if I do that today, is that considered a fix and go? No. No. (laughs) No. Okay. But if I went and I added back the obstacle before the tunnel, then now I've done a fix and go. That's correct. Gotcha. Okay. I'm just making this very clear for myself and for everybody who's going to have similar questions. Yep. Yep. Okay. I think the, the last area um, well, I think there's two more areas, but one of them is the start line. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I know a ton of people are going to be using this for a start line and, um, and they were I, this past weekend. <laughs> yeah. So it's very interesting because I, at first I didn't think this was going to be the most common use, but now that I think about it more and more, it's going to be very high usage because the start lines are such a problem for so many. I was people. surprised by that also. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So the, I think one thing that everybody needs to know that they may not be aware of now in, at least in the American Kennel Club, is if I sit my dog down, down them or whatever at, at their start line in their position, and I walk away from them and I move past the plane of the first jump, right? And they get up or start moving. But don't take the jump. But they don't take the jump. Okay. If I stay where I am and I tell them to sit and then they sit, I can keep leading out or, or going on into wherever I was planning on leading out from. But if I go back to them in order to have them sit down, right? If I go back and have them go, so let's say between my legs or come around to my left side, like people have these uh, routines, little routines that they yeah. do to set their dog up. So if I reset my dog up, I am not permitted to lead out again. I have to run quote unquote with my dog. Right. That's the current rule. So a lot of people don't know that. So you can go back, Reset your dog up. You just can't lead out again. Right, right. Okay. So I think that's important for people to know. And so now let's say I did lead out again. What would happen? That's your fix and go. That's my fix and go. Yeah. And, and that's the other interesting thing I think about fix and go is uh, the handler doesn't necessarily have to know that they're doing it, right? It's really right. like, I'm sure that I'm sure that under the old rules, there were, there were, you know, novice competitors or whatever that oh, they went it. back. They got whistled. Yeah, they got whistled. Like, they had no what? idea. They're like, I didn't know I couldn't do that. So let's take that same novice competitor. They go, they fix their dogs, sit, and they lead out again. They're in fix and go, whether they realize it or not. But this time they're not getting whistled off. But they're not they, getting whistled the off. They get to telling them they do the whole run. They think, yeah, I got a clean run. The judge <laughs> yeah, that's is like, true. oh no, sorry. And they don't lose their run. But they don't use their, <laughs> yeah, lose yeah. their run. But they yeah. think the other thing that's even better is that, you know, the dog that um, breaks criteria by standing up or scooching, right? That's one kind of break, but there are plenty of dogs that you're leading out and they, they self-release and they take the first jump. And yeah. before you, you had no option other than to go ahead and run. And I tell you, you know, we tell students all the time, like, 
the likelihood of you keeping it together at that point is so low. Like I all know. of your timing is off, right? The Usually a mistake happens in the first couple of obstacles because you aren't where you plan to be for a front cross or blind cross or whatever, right? Everything's all chaotic and the whole thing falls apart, right? Um, but now those handlers can go back, reset up the dog. And I think those are the dogs that are going to benefit the most in terms of the start line stay because they break, they take an obstacle and the handler's like, nope, we're going back to the beginning. And they're like, oh man. And they're like, whoa, something has changed. Right. You know, at this arena and this venue in this situation, we have never, I've never been brought back after taking this first jump after I leave on my own. Well, maybe this is like home. Maybe I And you could see the dogs this weekend doing that kind of going, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, th- I thought we were running agility. I didn't know we were training. Wait, now if I did it twice though, I would You'd be, be whistled I would be whistled off. off. Yeah. yeah. And then remember a lot of people, the dog would break and they would just pick the darn dog up and go marching off, which I always hated to see, but they did it. This way yeah. they don't have to do that. Right, they, they can actually train instead of marching off with their dog as part of the training. Right, right. because because that was well, they the would only... get one shot. I guess they would depend on your dog, obviously. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah and yeah, so yeah. you want to be careful that you set your dog up for success on your second try of anything, right? right? Of of the dog walk, like you can fix a dog walk, you know. But if your dog is unlikely to get it the second time, you know, it's right. that's kind of part of the mental math that you have to do in well, deciding very, how yeah, to use it's it. It's very interesting what you're saying, Sarah, because using the two together, because, you know, let's say I FEO time to beat, that's the first run of the day. Mm-hmm. And I get out there and I just work nothing but start lines and it takes 10 times, but my dog finally stays. So I can do a couple obstacles, time runs out and then I leave the ring. And now my next run is jumpers and I, and the dog breaks and takes the first one. I immediately bring them back. And say, hey, yep. this is just more of the same. And hopefully they don't test me the second time and then we can go on and have a great run. But using the two together it could be a very powerful thing for fixing the start line issue, which we know is highly contextual and you can't reproduce it in training. Right. And there's one other use of the fix and go that I wanted to, to point out because I think it's a very um, creative use uh, for some handlers and that is nothing has to go wrong. So let's say that you have been struggling with uh, your dog holding their dog walk down. And on this run, they get it right. You could mark release and put your hands on your dog and tell him what a good boy he is and love on him and pet him. And then you could start again. And that would be considered fix and go. So you can actually use it to reward correct behavior in the ring. I think as opposed to fixing a mistake in the ring. Right. Because working with sensitive dogs right now, one of the things we have people do, if they get good speed and the first couple obstacles, they'll do four or five obstacles and then leave the ring and reward their dog. Uh, kind of the, the reward is right. and then we, you manage yeah, to yeah, get yeah. through four. And, and yeah. then you add, you know, you add a couple obstacles every every run and, and you try and get them going through the whole course at full speed. Um, but now you can do this four or five obstacles, mark it, rub their belly. They'll be very excited. They'll be like, hey, you know, this feels different. This feels more like home. And then you can go and do some more obstacles. So I think yeah. that's that's pretty powerful. Okay. The last one that I wanted to ask about was bar knocking because I, I feel like this is the other area where a small group of people with really tough bar knockers are going to kind of push the envelope here, right? They're going to they're gonna really push on these rules. and so. The way that it's been written now, I think for both F- FEO and FNG, like you, the trainer, if my dog knocks a bar, I can go and reset the bar myself. Yep. So, that's, so some people find that very important. Some some people, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I guess real quick, you have to reset. Like nobody's going to go reset it for you, right? Like if you want to do it again, you have to go reset it. Well, they yeah, have. Then we also allow it. We never used to allow that before. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, so let's say that um, I want the bar setter to help me out and do it. Can I call a bar setter over and be like, hey, can you set this bar for me while I, or is that? I can't really answer that, but I would guess no. Okay. So I got to set my own bar. That's kind of outside assistance, isn't it? Right, 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 right. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So I'm going to reset the bar and uh, reattempt it. And if I do that more than once and it's FNG, then I get whistled off. If it's FEO, I'm okay. Okay, so this is where people are going to do other things. 
it says very specifically in the rules, and I'm going to quote this word for word here, quote, the dog may not be verbally or physically corrected for the error, end quote. And this is specifically for, for drop bars. So if my dog drops a bar and I scream out, no, and then I go and I pick up the bar and reset it, should I be excused? I think that you'd have to be there to know, understand the tone. Mm -hmm. Right. So someone might be saying no in anguish or no, like very angrily toward the dog. There has to be some kind of interpretation of punishment. Case by case basis on that one. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Now, um, what if it was more obvious? Well, I guess it would be obvious to me, but what if they said something like, no, bad dog, bad dog for dropping that bar. (laughs) And they pointed their finger at the dog and the, and, and the dog, like, cowered a little bit and the ears were back and then the owner went and grabbed the bar and put it up. Well, you know, that sounds like that should be a problem, but then think about a super sensitive dog where you can just go, Oh, fluffy what happened? And they act the same way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I'm going to be very interested in seeing how judges interpret this. Okay. I have a couple more questions. um, But it's also up to the exhibitors to understand the spirit of this. Right. Oh, certainly. The spirit of this is never punitive. Right. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. It's just that, you know, I've seen it. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, I've seen I it now under the current rules. So I, know. Um, I, I think um, uh, from uh, actually from a purely public PR viewpoint, like I think the disasters here and I think these these competitions are going to have to think about this. Sarah already mentioned nationals, but also the team trials, both international team trials and Westminster. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, even in the final, if you oh, think about yeah. that being on TV, right? right? And so I think, you know, that's something where maybe Westminster in conjunction with the AKC says, those rules don't apply here. Right. FBO, FNG not permitted in the finals right. at Westminster, right. right? you know, and and to put that out there. And we, um, we don't know that to be the case actually right now, just, just to be clear, um, because this program is soon, so new, I'm sure that people are going to ask, and I'm sure that question will be answered at some point. But uh, right. on this call, we don't happen to know if, right. if F and G is permissible at right. Westminster and Nationals or if they're considered right. because they're special events. Or even the, the, uh, the horse event, the, the long jeans. Because, yeah, the premier. Because what you don't want to have is a very high-level competitor – world team caliber type person and they've got one competition and then in two weeks they have a, a what they consider a bigger competition like maybe the world championship or trials or whatever and they say well i need the training here and you know i don't care what everybody thinks but the akc is very much going to care because thousands or hundreds of thousands or a million people are watching this um so i think that's one interesting uh thing okay let me get back to the bar so my dog drops a bar i pick up the bar and i I strike the ground with the bar. I don't know if you've seen people do that. And they might even pretend to be angry at the bar. Rather than directing any anger or punishment at the dog, they do it at the bar or the ground or the jump itself. So this is like an, I don't do this, but this is an actual training technique that people do. Right. And so how should it? judge? You know what? I think in some cases that could be considered a punitive thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the only reason to do it is to have an effect on the dog and that effect yeah. can't be positive. So by that interpretation, yeah, it's, it's either punitive or it's, or it doesn't, matter. you know, it, should, it, it had no effect in which case, why are you doing it? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you for letting me ask the very <laughs> tough questions that I could think of at the moment. Well, I think, I'm sure other I think situations the other, will pop up. The other thing I think is that is very, very common with bar knocking is having the dog lie down. And part of that is, oh, yeah, yeah, is yeah. management, I, right? Because you yeah. have to go and you have to go pick up the bar and you don't want your dog to to just – you know, run around or go visit the 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 uh, the ring crew or anything like that. So, um, but, but it's that. also considered by mo- most people who do it. It is kind of two for one. It's management of the dog, but it's also just this tiniest little bit of of correction to the dog. Well, you even see that at the start line, right? Someone, yeah, but you know, remember line. we've we've allowed people to do that with their dogs to bring them under control. Right, 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 right. So we allow, it's like, hey, if you need to bring your dog under control, you can do something about that. So this right. isn't something that someone needs to worry about if they're like, lie down. I'm one of those handlers that always yells, lie down. I- I'm not. I'm just saying if I were, yeah. you know. Well, hopefully yeah. they're not being mean to the dog. But, you know, we have allowed people to do that. Or like you said, you're just asking the dog to study while you set the bar. I'm sure right. that's fine. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. 
Well, thank you so much for letting us do all of our what ifs. Um, I think this, these programs are amazing. And I, I think that as time goes by, we're just going to realize even more how, um, how, what a game changer this is in terms of training and trialing our dogs in AKC agility. Uh, and for even people who do other organizations, having this available to them uh, for the times that they, they do come and do AKC agility and knowing how those programs work is really important. And again, remember that these are pilot programs that they are meant to be helpful to the dog and to the dog training, but most importantly to the dog um, and uh, to uh, listen to your judges and, and uh, you know, respect their call on this because we are asking a lot of them um, by adding these programs. We're asking for a lot of more subjective calls, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, but that, that is what they've been hired to do is to go in and make those subjective calls. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Kitty. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys for uh, doing a podcast, helping uh, bring some clarity to these uh, new uh, programs that we have. Oh, yeah. And there was one more thing that I wanted to mention about them, which is that, um, that you know, it's only six days old. And we threw a lot of what ifs at, at Kitty. Um, but uh, when you take the entire agility population, <laughs> there's going to be a lot more what ifs. And those uh, what ifs are going to be continually evaluated. And um, all the judges will have to go back and, and report the kinds of things that they're seeing. And they're going to meet together as groups. And they're going to decide, you know, what is acceptable and what is not. And we are certainly, you know, I'm just going to say, you know, it's not a might. It's a certain fact that there will be additional clarifications, additional things that um, that the leadership in AKC Agility decides is acceptable or not, and additional clarifications. So expect those throughout this entire program. Expect it to be a little bit fluid and changing. And for you know something that happened one weekend after review to be um, declared that you know that's not the kind of thing that we want in this program going forward. And I guess the best place for people, you know, if they are really curious about staying up to date on the kinds of things that judges are being uh, told by the leadership would be the judge's blog, right? Absolutely. So and we've the, got thousands of people that um, are member or that actually subscribe to that blog. Right. It is not just for judges. I didn't know no. about this for a very long time, but there is a, a blog and it's basically how uh, the leadership of AKC Agility can continue to clarify and, and uh, refine things um, and educate their judges. And so the judges are supposed to be up to date on everything that's in that blog. But, you know, as competitors, it's, it's good for us to know what is being told to the judges. <laughs> right? And, you know, the way I look at that blog is it's a very public blog. In other words, um, people all over the world are looking at it. Right. So, so we will put links to um, all of the information on Fix and Go, but also a link to that blog so that people can stay up to date on that. That's great. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, hitaboard.com, 1TDC.com, and NTI Global. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. They also offer tamer and anchor weight bags along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com today. Happy training.